In the early 1960s, a private company proposed a project that promised to solve one of America's biggest problems, chronic water shortages in the West, forever. The cost? An estimated one trillion dollars. I'm your host, Regis, and in this video, we're diving into a project unlike any we've ever covered before. A multi-nation engineering marvel that would have stretched across an entire continent, requiring three decades to build. But first, why does America even have a water problem in the first place? Well, there's really only one reason post-war prosperity. Following the end of World War II, the United States experienced a baby boom. Between 1946 and 1964, around 76 million babies were born in the United States, nearly 30 million more than in the 18 years before. And growth wasn't just limited to the bellies of pregnant women. U.S. industrial output nearly doubled during this time period as well. Factories that once produced tanks and fighter planes swiftly pivoted to producing cars and household products. And this huge increase in production meant an equally huge increase in the amount of water needed. In 1950, the United States was withdrawing around 180 billion gallons of water from its rivers, lakes, and aquifers every day. By 1960, that number rose to 270 billion. And nowhere was that water more needed than in the arid American West. These hot, dry regions get very little rainfall, usually less than 10 to 15 inches a year. And the heat causes water to evaporate quickly, making it hard to keep reservoirs full. This problem was most apparent in places like California, Nevada, Arizona, and western Texas, where the population was quickly rising and the need for more easily accessible water wasn't just a problem for the people in the United States. The north of Mexico was also in desperate need of water, dealing with similar problems like its northern neighbor. Okay, but all of that was over 60 years ago, so what's the situation today? Of course, major steps had been taken to improve access to water in these regions, like the Parker Dam, constructed in California, and later the Glen Canyon Dam, which was constructed in 1963 in Arizona, but both are easily overshadowed by the most famous and important of America's dams, the Hoover Dam. Standing at 221 meters high and 379 meters long, the Hoover Dam was an engineering marvel at its construction in 1936. Sitting between Nevada and Arizona, this massive barricade created Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the entire United States. During the 60s, the lake held around 5.5 trillion gallons of water, but the dams also served another purpose, clean energy generation. When water is released from a dam's reservoir, it cascades down through turbines, causing them to spin. This process converts the kinetic energy of flowing water into electrical energy, powering everything from homes to entire cities, all while keeping carbon emissions to the bare minimum. But despite all of the impressive dams and other projects like the All-American Canal that diverted water from the Colorado River to irrigate the Imperial Valley in California, a worry still remains. How can the nation keep growing and producing if we don't have enough water? It was a valid concern. Sure, the country was riding a wave of post-war optimism. After living through the deadliest war in human history, people believed that the hard times were over. The economy was booming, babies were being born by the millions, and the future looked bright. But some planners were looking ahead, and they realized that if the explosive growth continued, the United States could eventually hit a population of over 600 million people. And no one was more concerned about America's water supply than this guy, Ralph M. Parsons. Having started his business in 1944, Parsons was slowly building a reputation as the go-to guy for big engineering projects. In the early 1950s, he snatched up a government contract that saw his team design and engineer the test stands for Air Force rocket engines. A few years later, his company would build Turkey's first oil refinery. And a few years after that, he would design an entire ICBM launch site at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in Southern California. It's safe to say that old Ralph was doing pretty well for himself, but money wasn't the most important part. The important part was the federal connections he was making. And those connections would lead him to proposing one of the most audacious and expansive construction projects ever conceived. 
It's at this point in the video that I have to admit something to you guys. I haven't been completely honest about North America's water supply, because the continent actually has a ton of water. The problem is that it's deep in the Northwest, in Canada and Alaska, and most of that water empties out into the ocean. Thus, an idea was born. Redirect all that rainfall and all of those rivers into the heart of the United States and down into the north of Mexico. The project was called the North American Water and Power Alliance, or NAWAPA for short. And before we dive into how NAWAPA would work, we quickly want to thank our long-term partner CyberGhost VPN for sponsoring this video. Have you ever hesitated to connect to a public Wi-Fi network in a restaurant or a hotel or an airport for fear that someone might steal your information? Well, here's the solution. CyberGhost VPN, one of the best VPN services that encrypts your information and protects you while you browse the internet safely. With over 38 million users worldwide and a near-perfect score on Trustpilot, CyberGhost VPN is one of the most recommended services on the market. A VPN is essential for protecting your digital privacy. Your internet service provider, public Wi-Fi, or even websites can track what you do online. But with CyberGhost VPN, all of your traffic is encrypted and your IP is hidden keeping you completely anonymous. On top of that, you can use CyberGhost VPN on up to seven devices at the same time, be that your mobile phone, computer, tablet, and even share it with your family or friends. It's perfect for protecting all of your devices. Plus, CyberGhost VPN lets you unblock exclusive content from platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and more in other countries. Change your virtual location in a couple of clicks and enjoy the US catalog or any library that's not available in your specific region. And if you're still not sure, CyberGhost offers a 45-day money-back guarantee. Check them out at cyberghostvpn.com slash megabuilds for 84% off and four months for free and start browsing safely today. Thanks again to CyberGhost VPN for sponsoring this video. And now let's take a closer look at the insane Nawapa mega project. The plan would start here, near the headwaters of the Yukon River. Dams would be built to block the river's natural flow into the Bering Sea, creating a massive reservoir. From there, a network of canals, tunnels, and pumping stations would be used to lift and redirect the water over natural topographical barriers. With the water now able to move to the south, additional reservoirs would be built for the Lyard and Peace Rivers in British Columbia. The idea was to build the reservoirs up high, so gravity could do most of the work, letting the water flow down with force and cutting down the need for pumping. Being at high elevation also meant that they could generate hydroelectric power, which helped to generate the energy needed to pump the water uphill later. With water from all three rivers flowing south, engineers planned to use the natural dip of the Rocky Mountain Trench to guide it along, converting it into a huge 500-mile-long, 19-mile-wide reservoir, with the trench acting as a central storage hub for the Northwest's diverted water. From there, the water would flow into Montana and central Idaho. The hydroelectric power from the newly built dams would provide power for the pumping stations, allowing the water to be lifted via a giant dump lift to the Sawtooth Reservoir in southwestern Montana. From there, it would flow by gravity through the system's western section, passing through a tunnel in Sawtooth Mountain, where it would then flow south along the border area of Utah and Nevada. It was here that the water would separate, one branch going east to Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, and another going southwest, through Nevada and California, and finally, northwestern Mexico. Of course, if it was going to be a true North American alliance, Canada would have to get a piece of this pie. So some of the water would be diverted from the Peace River and would head east, moving by canal to the Great Lakes Basin. Once water was added to Lake Superior, it could be transported through existing and new canals to the other Great Lakes and eventually into the St. Lawrence Seaway, linking the water-rich northern and western regions with the agricultural heartlands and urban centers of the Prairie Provinces. Just filling up the Great Lakes alone would be incredibly helpful to get Canada on board with the plan. The lakes are sensitive to seasonal variations in water volume, and even in the 1960s, declining levels were beginning to affect shipping and navigation. As a brucey bonus for Canada, the plan would potentially have included a navigable waterway in Canada from Alberta to Lake Superior, nicknamed the Transcontinental Canal. Mexico wouldn't make out too bad from this deal either, with Nawapa delivering almost triple its amount of irrigable land. 
Sure, it's not as much as Canada, but it would have been incredibly beneficial to this hot, dry nation. And they'd also get access to 2 gigawatts of power, with 1.2 being generated in Mexico itself. The minds behind Nawapa truly believed that the project would substantially raise the standard of living for the Mexican people. But, of course, the biggest winner from this deal was the United States, getting nearly 78 million acre-feet of water annually, easily accessible and ready to be used to support the growing superpower, increasing irrigable land by over 60,000 square miles. The project would also generate 3.8 gigawatts of power for the country, which they could either use themselves or sell to their northern and southern neighbors. For context, that's enough to power over 3 million modern homes just from hydroelectrics alone. Parsons believed that the project would increase the annual national income by approximately $30 billion. Now, that's over $300 billion in today's money. But how much time and manpower would a megaproject of this scale even require? Well, in total, the original plan for Nawapa would consist of no less than 369 separate projects, and would require 200 million stacks of cement, 30 million tons of steel, and 100,000 tons of copper and aluminum. According to the Parsons Company, the project would create, both directly and indirectly, around 4 million new jobs, and the proposed construction timeline? 30 years. Now, that may sound like forever, but when you look at the sheer scale of something like this, I kind of don't even think that's long enough. Now, I'm sure there is one question on all of your minds. Was a project like this even possible? Like, just from an engineering perspective? Well, the United States government and many engineers of the time had that exact same question, and they all pretty much reached the same conclusion. All of this was possible from a technical perspective. You really could divert Canada and Alaska's rivers and have the water reach all the way to Mexico if you had, you know, a trillion dollars lying around. Because as you might have guessed, the cost is where things really began to fall apart here. In 1964, the Parsons Company calculated that the project would cost around $100 billion over the 30-year construction timeline, over a trillion dollars in today's money. For context, President Eisenhower's interstate highway system that connected the nation by road cost half of that. The problem was that the investment case for Nawapa was, to put it mildly, a little crazy. The first issue was the financing. The staggering cost of the project would have been split between the three nations, with the United States likely footing most of the bill. A construction timeline this long and with this kind of money involved was a recipe for disaster. Because if one nation ran into some financial difficulties and wanted to back out, it would quickly turn into a diplomatic nightmare. And even if the three countries all managed to make an agreement and pay their part, would they even see a return on that investment? Well, according to Parsons, Yes. In fact, the company estimated that the $100 billion cost would be recouped in just 50 years thanks to water and energy sales. But of course he would say that. The man had a vested interest in the project going ahead for crying out loud, and it wasn't like he was paying for it. There are a million different things that can go wrong on a project of this scale. Complex damming, tunneling, and canal building across varied terrains for 4,000 kilometers comes with a lot of logistical challenges. Although concerns about the project's true cost raised doubts, a lot of influential people in Washington absolutely loved the idea. In 1966, Texas Congressman Jim Wright wrote a book about a potential future water famine. On the topic of Nawapa, he said this, Nawapa has an almost limitless potential if we possess the courage and the foresight to grasp it. A year later, the senator for Utah, Frank Moss, also came out in support of the project. It seemed like things were really starting to get moving, and that the mega project might actually come to fruition, with even the Canadian Prime Minister seemingly warming to the idea. But the optimism was short-lived, because the 1970s were here. And with the 1970s came the rise of American environmentalism. And as you can probably imagine, they weren't too thrilled about the whole idea, with the environmental issues beginning at the root of the megaplan in Alaska and northwestern Canada. Near the Yukon River, the diversion of water from rivers that flowed naturally into the Arctic or Pacific was seen as a threat to fish migration and the overall health of aquatic habitats. And the environmental concerns continued down the path. Like, sure, turning the Rocky Mountain Trench into a massive reservoir sounds great in theory, but in reality, it would have come with a ton of problems. 
Critics argued that flooding such a huge area would wipe out wilderness, forests, and wetlands, destroying natural habitats and putting local wildlife at risk. Not to mention the damage that all this construction would do to the indigenous population of Canada, who make up over 20% of Yukon's population. So it's no wonder that according to author Peter Hannons, many environmentalists began viewing the project as the hydrologic antichrist. And while the environmental concerns were valid, let's face it, the main reason it didn't get built is because of the price tag. Today, there are still many advocates for Nawapa, most notably Lyndon LaRouche's army of political followers. The political activist expressed support for the project in the early 1980s, and even after his death, his supporters still promote it. In April of 2012, they released a 100-page economic report titled Nawapa 21, but we couldn't actually find a copy of it to read, though a YouTube channel does exist. But what are your thoughts on the ill-fated Nawapa project? Do you think it would have improved the world or damaged it more? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you want to try CyberGhost VPN, use our link in the description for 84% off and four months for free, as well as 45 days money back guaranteed. Enjoy having full access to blocked content on the internet while browsing safely. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.